Um, okay, I'll just, this is going to be quite a experiment here. <laughs> okay, right. So um, <clears throat> let, let's uh, let's kick it off. Um, okay, so uh, firstly, I'd like to say thanks to Loney for uh, kicking me out of my uh, COVID-related sort of uh, rest and uh, hibernation in, in Paternoster and to the Geological Society for um, for giving me the opportunity to, uh, to speak to you guys this afternoon. Okay, so although the what I'm going to talk about is um, not uh, from the Northern Cape, um, the uh, what you're going to see are um, examples of intrusions emplaced into orogenic belts that are actually directly analogous to the, um, the Grenvillian Age and the Maquinatal belt. The uh, cyclicity of supercontinent amalgamation and disintegration, um, what I'm going to show you um, in shows that there's commonalities between um, belts of different ages and in different parts of the world. And it shows that it's a relatively well-ordered process within which globally distributed elements um, display remarkable similarities. So. What I'm going to speak about is um, the amalgamation of Gondwana land, but it could equally apply to the previous amalgamation of Rodinia and possibly even earlier um, supercontinents as well. Okay, so the first thing is uh, I'm an economic geologist, so um, I've always got to consider the science, science under the constraints of economics, and I'm a nickel PGE specialist with almost 30 years of experience now but my main objective is always to understand my subject matter to the best of my ability and this in turn enables the appropriate exploration strategies to be applied so from the economic perspective the only um, real target with respect to um, nickel sulfide is to exclusively target large high-grade bodies of massive sulfide mineralization, um, which is a particularly difficult target. We all also most likely know that with the exception of Sudbury, um, all nickel sulfide ore bodies are associated with regions of uh, high magma flux, um, with the main settings being high-level subvolcanic feeder intrusions to large igneous provinces uh, extruded flood basalts, such as Narilsk, Pechanga, Mid-Continental Rift, etc. Um, the second setting um, is an intermediate level conduits and satellite intrusions to large intrusive complexes, such as the Bushveld, Voises Bay, and the satellite intrusions thereof. Um, and a third category, um, which I'm going to talk about, are intermediate to deep level conduit intrusions that are ho hosted within high metamorphic grade uh, long-lived intracratonic intra orogenic margins to cratonic core regions. And the examples I'm going to talk about are Antarka Hill, Limuero, Akali Congo, and Londo Comanana. Now, whereas styles one and two are reasonably well-researched, documented, and understood, style three remains very poorly researched. And in general, the bigger picture aspect has not been understood or documented. Also importantly, these are all emplaced in compressional environments. Now, a lot of the literature argue will always talk about extension. Well, in fact, the majority of intrusions are in place in a compressional environment. So we're gonna look at um, the, the approximately 750 to 500 million years assembly of Gondwan land. And the commonalities are actually very important because they can be used for exploration targeting strategy. and they, 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 they have relevance to other terrains, such as the Grenvillian, which hosts Skabanga, Nova, and also Yakimainspan in the Northern Cape. So why is this mineralization style important? And this, um, this graph here shows um, sulfide projects greater than 10 million tons, um, showing resource tonnage and, si and grade, and it's sized by contained metal. So what you can see up here, um, are a group of deposits that are all characterized by high grade. They're only moderate sized, but, um, but a, a lot of metal crammed into, into a fairly small tonnage. And all of these um, intrusions are emplaced into intracratonic margins. So 
This setting is globally extensive. It's well exposed um, and preserved, importantly. Um, preservation of, um, of, of particularly continental flood basalts is a serious issue. So maybe the, um, due to its being a high level environment and, and often um, very so, um, prone to uh, removal by erosion, the, the preservation factor is quite significant. So also with respect to exploration strategy, if you identify analogs, you reduce risk. So within these terrains, there's, there's greater potential for discovery of premium quality deposits um, relative to other terrains. Okay, so focusing in on Gondwana land, um, the um, breakup of the supercontinent Rodinia at around about a thousand million years resulted in, in separation into, into several fragments, uh, East Gondwana land and uh, West Gondwana land broke up uh, into several smaller fragments. These were separated by oceans of up to a thousand kilometers, maybe more in width. Um, and there was the full um, gamut of, um, of processes taking place. So there was sub-basin rifting, arc formation, and inter intermittent closure, and then, sub, um, then rifting again. The main period of enclosure from around about 720 to 550 million years resulted in a complex array of um, compressional um, morphologies with um, delamination, deep crustal um, subduction um, and, and perturbation of the mantle. Also, older sutures were, were reactivated um, and at various periods, um, mafic and ultramafic intrusions were in, in, in place at intermediate to deep crustal conditions um, throughout these belts. So this um, image shows um, sh shows Gondwana land, um, and what you can see um, this is Salman's uh, publication. So you can see he's highlighted some of the belts, but important belts that we're going to talk about, such as going around the margin of the Congo Craton and into Borborema, are not included here. Nor is the nor is this area along the western margin. Uh, of Gabon, and there's other intrusions there as well. Um, what I've also highlighted here to show the commonality between belts of different ages are some of the Grenville age orogenic belts as well. So, so this is the Fraser Range coming through in, in Australia into, into the, um, the Musgraves, the, the, the Namakwa Natal down here, and the Kibaran belt in, um, in, the, in, the, in the Congo Craton. And, and I've highlighted here um, uh, Nova Bollinger, which is uh, around about 14 million tons at 2% nickel. Uh, Kabanga, which is uh, over 60 million tons now at um, so 3.5% um, combined metals. And Yaka Mainspan, which is also lower grade, but also a significant nickel sulfide deposit. Okay, so what we're looking at here is um, the GLAM data set, which is uh, Graham Begg, uh, um, who um, has done a lot of work on continent reconstruction and mapping um, through time. So this is um, uh, his cracked on the orientations at 800 million years and showing all of the various interpreted um, deformation and structures and structural trends. Um, it's a little bit um, schematic. Um, for instance, this um, the lower um, part of Africa wasn't amalgamated at this time. Um, and um, and uh, the Borborema could have, could have, I mean, South America was was um, fragmented into a lot more components, but it's still of use. So what what I'm what 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 we're going to look at here? We're going to look at um, Antarctica Hill, uh, Limuero, Akali Congo, and Londo Komanana. Um, and what you can see is the location of all these intrusions. So I'm not going to show these locations again. Um, in, on, on the sort of global sense. So just remember these orientations. So now if we fast forward to 700 million years, what you can see is um, Africa has amalgamated and the, um, the, 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 the these uh, orogenic belts have now formed. So this is uh, Borborema coming through into, into the um, Northern Congo region. Um, and this Southern belt here is, is where is, is where the southern part of uh, Gondwana land amalgamated onto the onto the rest of the continent. So, in more detail, <clears throat> the uh, 
this amalgamation took place in two or, th or more uh, major um, events. Um, the East African orogeny was the first, which um, um, started around about 800 and finished around about 650 million years. And then the Kungan orogeny from 600 to 530 accreted um, Southern Africa, Antarctica, and Australia onto the southern onto onto the southern margin, as it's currently expressed, of um, Gondwanaland. Okay, so before we move on to the rocks, what I want to um, what I want to just talk about is um, the uh, the key fundamentals of observational skills when applied to interpretative geology. Um, it's critical to understand what to look at, firstly, and this has to be contextualized and ranked by the working genetic model and also the relative importance of each parameter. Um, some observations are definitive and they place a hard constraint on other parameters or observations and interpretation of these observations. Um, so the, the definitive um, parameters include contact relationships between intrusions and their host rock, xenolith compositions and characteristics, and relationships between the various lithological units of an intrusion. Obs other observations are less definitive, for instance, geochronology. Now, this has been quite a hotly debated topic in igneous um, geology recently. But the thing is, although the geochronological chrono date itself may be precise, it's important to understand exactly what is being dated. So for instance, uh, often cross-cutting intrusions are used to date various events. However, often intrusions that are in place at deep level um, cause melting and migmatization of the sidewall, and therefore you get back veins which may look like a later intrusion, but it's actually syngenetic to the main intrusion. Um, also, rock relationships without clear contact constraints, so isolated outcrops. Um, sometimes um, these can be definitive, but other times not. However, the most important fundamental concept here is once you make a definitive observation, all ensuing interpretation must respect this constraint. Now, dependence on, this, on the observation, you may only need to make one for it to be definitive, such as if you see a chilled margin, it is absolutely 100% definitive. And you, only, you don't need to see hundreds of them, you only need to see one. Xenoliths as well, if you have a deformed xenolith inside a non-deformed intrusion, it is definitive. You only need to see one of these and, they, and it is absolutely definitive. So the most important thing is once a definitive observation is being made, all ensuing interpretation must respect this constraint. Now, this is a, in the, in the igneous context, this is a natural e extension of the principle of superposition, which is a fundamental core skill requirement for interpretative geology. And, 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 through, and, and, and through this uh, derivation of exploration strategy, yet it's absolutely unbelievable in how many instances these fundamental observations are simply not made, not recognized, difficult to make from the office, um, and just generally overlooked. And this, this also applies to a lot of the literature as well. Okay, so let's look at the uh, uh, Antarka Hill in Tanzania. So Antarka Hill is located in southeastern Tanzania. Um, it was originally discovered um, during, I'm just gonna get the pointer on, uh, pointer options, laser. Okay, so it was a, it originally initially discovered during the 1950s because there's a massive sulfide body here which outcrops and there's a malachite gossen that overlies it. Um, then it was subsequently forgotten about and rediscovered um, by Goldstream during 2005 in, uh, in JV with Longman. Um, subsequent um, exploration has shown that it's a, it's a fairly large intrusion. It's 800 meters thick, uh, 2000 meters across, and it's in place into Paranice. It has um, mineral resources of over 56 million tons at 0.71% nickel equivalent. And um, David Mole uh, in 2017 um, got the best, uh, it's a shrimp age of uh, 660 million years. So it's fairly, the age is fairly late in the, um, in the grand scheme of the origin, orogeny. 
Um, the complex out, outcrop pattern here is um, is defined by numerous internal zenolith screens of deformed gneiss um, that de compartmentalize magma influxes into a series of, of uh, lipar lee sills. Um, and high-grade mineralization is located within um, these um, pencil-shaped bodies that plunge down. So this is a sort of a a 3D view here, and you can see these bodies of mineralization are quite localized, and they plunge down to the south-southeast. Um, and often massive mineralization, such as here, is located at the frontal margins within the country rock. So the frontal tips of these sills, there's, there's often massive sulfide mineralization. <clears throat> okay. Next. Um, okay, so... When running through the toolkit, um, the first thing to look at is the contact relationships. So what we can see here are um, contact zones between the intrusion and the country rock. Um, now, there's been a long debate about the timing of emplacement and deformation. And some of the papers, such as the one in economic geology, will tell you that the intrusion is so deformed that no one really knows what's going on. Well, actually, these, these two images and the couple of them I'm going to show you resolve this situation very clearly. So what we can see here is medium grain pyroxenite that comes to a, uh, comes down to a contact zone of um, interlayered uh, migmatized gneiss and non-deformed um, uh, pyroxenite. And the contact is here. And you can see here we've got uh, medium grain pyroxenite that comes more or less all the way to the contact. Now. There is no um, strain partitioning or displacement or any form of deformation on this contact whatsoever. And what you can see as well is that these uh, migmatite blocks within the intrusion are also originally of deformed gneiss. So the, this image on the right shows, um, shows these nice um, zenoliths that are forming um, consistently or, um, located screens within the intrusion. Um, and you can see that they're partly assimilated and altered, and the intrusion is stoping deformed nice. <clears throat> okay, so just two more um, images here. So um, in some instances, such as here, you can see that um, the contact zone is intensely migmatized and um, medium grain pyroxenite uh, extends right to the contact. So what we're looking at here Okay, and this is Hartsburgite in this area here. So what we're looking at here is a, is a zone where the intrusion is thermally eroding, and not only itself, but also the sidewall. Uh, in other instances, there's a chilled basal margin, which can be a couple of meters thick. Um, compositionally, this is a pyroxenite, um, and, the, the, um, and it forms a chilled margin going right to the, right, more or less right to the contact. Numerous uh, zenoliths are entrained within the intrusion. And as I mentioned, they're lo located at consistent stratigraphic intervals. And you can see quite clearly that this is a nice. So it's already deformed before entrainment. And what you can see here is the intrusion is actually stoping in and then melting this, um, this nice. So what we're looking at here is a whole series of sills that compartmentalize magma flow into a series of stacked sills that locally mix and coalesce. Also, given that this intrusion is mineralized, this morphology clearly provides very significant constraints to magma mixing models because we don't have a classically vertical magma chamber here. We've got a whole series of very thin, sometimes less than 10 meter thick sills that have um, carried enough sulfide into the system to be able to deposit significant uh, massive sulfide deposits. Okay, so looking at the uh, lithologies, the intrusion is predominantly ultramafic. So it's predominantly pyroxenite. There's some Hartsburgite, but there's very little um, uh, intermediate or evolved material. In fact, there, in fact, almost none. So what we can see here is these, these are two examples of, um, of py the pyroxenite. And one of the things that's immediately apparent 
is that the the um, the mineralogy is pristine. There's no alteration. There's no deformation. And what you can see very clearly here are the brown orthopyroxenes here, and you can see the, glee, the green clinopyroxenes here um, within rocks that are neither altered nor metamorphosed. <clears throat> the Hartsburgites are serpentinized, and they've got uh, poikilitic textures or granular primary textures. Um, they're serpentinized, um, and also what you can see are these cross-cutting um, pyroxenite, um, pyro well, pyroxene veins. Um, these, these are late stage magmatic features. So what it's indicating is that the intrusion was then placed, formed a poikilitic texture, serpentinized, and then subsequently these veins formed. These are related to late stage mi fluid migration through the, through the cumulate pile. Um, and due to incorporation and melting of zenoliths, these fluids are silica rich, and that replaces the olivine by these pyroxene um, aggregates. We'll see this in several of the intrusions. Um, the intrusion, ho ho intrusion hosts um, high tenor disseminated and massive sulfide mineralization um, at various intervals. Um, and here what you can see is massive sulfide injected into the pyrox pyroxenite hosts. Uh, so this is internally within the intrusion. So at several levels, as the intrusion was building up, it was introducing sulfide, and that sulfide was deposited. So what you can see here is that the sulfide has actually brecciated its host rock, and, it, and it's been injected into already lithified um, magma. In other instances, you can see um, where the, the sulfide liquid is draining down and forming little veinlets um, through through the, um, the cumulate pile. Um, in this instance, um, what we're looking at here is um, amphibolitized um, pyroxenite. And again, this amphibolitization occurs as a late stage um, alteration during the emplacement of the intrusion. <laughs> Massive sulfide um, is um, often present and it can be extremely high tenor. So on the top, we're looking at 15% uh, nickel massive sulfide. Um, very low PGE content, it's predominantly base metal um, dominated. But what you can see here are these very large uh, pentlandite and chalcopyrite grains. Beautiful looking sulfide. Um, and also what we can see, what, what, what we see is um, sulfide injected into the country rock nice. So you can see here, this sulfide has been injected along fractures. And these are probably fractures that are generated resulting from the intrusion, the intruding magma. Um, and this, this um, sulfide brecciates and locally stopes into the, um, into the country rock. Now this is not um, deformed or remobilized sulfide. This has been emplaced by primary magmatic processes. So it's a common fallacy that sulfide can be remobilized. It's actually thermodynamically highly unlikely in any setting. So all of these features here, this, this um, breccia texture, are all primary magmatic sulf um, mineralization processes. Now, interestingly as well, massive sulfide often forms bodies at the frontal tips of blind sill terminations. So that's the case as Antarctica. Um, it's probably very similar at Nova in uh, Western Australia. The uh, intrusion appears to terminate and the, and the massive sulfide is at the frontal closure. Okay, so moving across to um, Brazil, uh, what we're looking at here is a, a, a CPRM, which is a, the geological survey, um, radiometric image of the Borborema belt. So in 2009, the uh, CPRM flew um, magnetics and radiometrics in this belt, which was thought to be of low potential. Um, Photoran team Matthijs um, purchased this data and went through it, and they and they identified a whole series of, of um, targets. One of which is this little fellow here, um, and ground follow up um, identified within these. These are all sugarcane plantations. 
uh, and this is an intrusion. Uh, it's called a buffet intrusion, and, and there's a there's a gossen located just there. This is that gossen, and you can see it's um, pretty toxic. There's no vegetation growing here, and and this is what it actually looks like on on the ground. Um, so th these this, these these um, um, analyses prompted the company to undertake further exploration, and the discovery hole um, number four intersected 161 and a half meters at 0.28 percent nickel uh, with some associated copper and uh, PGMs, including um, four and a half meters at 1.2 percent nickel um, associated with um, uh, four massive sulfide um, stringer zones, which are illustrated here. <clears throat> so Limoero, based on further drilling, um, is, um, was uh, defined as a contract concentrically zoned conduit intrusion, 250 meters wide, uh, thick 500 meters wide, um, which uh, shallowly plunges to the west. Now, internally, it has lenticular geometry and it has um, uh, an upper sequence, a transition zone, and a lower sequence. The upper sequence locally cross cuts the underlying stratigraphy. Um, the upper sequence also hosts disseminated sulfide with high tenor, up to four layers of high tenor massive sulfide towards the base. And you can see the tenors there. Um, so, from the, the main lithologies are pyroxenite and Hartsburgite. Again, very little, if not, no um, mafic material in this intrusion at all. And around the margins, um, there's an amphilatized zone due to interaction with the uh, Paranice country rock. <clears throat> okay, so again, running through the toolkit, um, look at the contact relationships. So this is the lower contact here, just there. And what you can see is there's a, um, a fairly sharp uh, contact. There's the, um, the, the contact is, is uh, amphibole altered. Um, there's not, um, you can see here, so this is amphibolatized pyroxenite. There's a bit of a hybrid zone on the contact, and then you're into the paranice. There's no strain partitioning on this contact. There's no deformation. Um, and this is a, a primary contact um, between a younger intrusion and an older host rock. So this, um, one of the things about that's well exposed here as well is um, the, the, in, the intrusion um, causes contact metamorphism of its of its country rock. It's quite subtle. So this is now the the um, gneiss that's overlying the intrusion. And what you can see here is recrystallization to a granoblastic glassy quartzite. This is quite distinctive and quite typical of these intrusions, but it's very rarely recognized and it's often actually mapped as quartzite. So people do recognize it, but they don't recognize what's caused it. <laughs> Okay, so looking at some of the lithologies, um, the upper chilled amphibolatized pyroxenite has a secular uh, quench texture. You can sort of see it here. Um, and that overlies amphibole altered um, pyroxenite. And, and this is a fairly um, compositionally co um, simple intrusion. <clears throat> Between the pyroxenite and the Hartsburgite, there's a very sharp, distinct contact. And there's no evidence whatsoever of fractionation or mixing between these lithologies. And this is another typical feature of these conduit intrusions. What you can see here is the Hartsburgite um, has also um, uh, post-cumulus uh, growth of, um, of, of these uh, pyroxenes and amphibole altered pyroxenes. Um, Again, probably most likely due to um, incorporation of uh, silica-rich uh, liquids. Uh, but what you can see here, now uh, this is borehole core, but now we were fortunate in that we have um, exposures in a quarry. And, and these outcrops show, the, um, show that these, these textures are, 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 are or similarly orientated um, and, and uh, they're not at all random. Okay, so looking at sulfide mineralization, 
Um, the Limoy area hosts both disseminated and massive sulfide mineralization in the upper, upper sequence. Um, and the two are not directly related. It's, there's, there's no indication that where you have more disseminated, you've got more massive. They seem to be separate entities. So the massive sulfide mineralization forms stringers that have sharp, often, well, often have sharp cross-cutting relationships to the host peridotite. Um, and again, resulting from forceful injection of liquid sulfide driven by magma pressure in, within the conduit into already lithified rock. So the lower part of the intrusion was hard and the upper part was still active. Um, and you can see here it's causing local brecciation. So other veins have, have what, are what is called soft walled. So these penetrate along grain boundaries and stope into the, and infiltrate the host rock. <clears throat> okay, so now we're going to move to Uganda, and we're located up on the on the north in northern Uganda, north uh, west Uganda, um, in the in the um, near, near Kikum Pader. Um, so during 2012, um, Sipa Resources entered this part of Uganda. What they were looking for was zinc um, in a, in a similar sort of setting to some of the Australian deposits. Um, what what they what they did is they um, they implemented a, an extensive regional soil sampling campaign, and in 2014 they discovered the Akali Congo intrusion. So uh, Akali Congo um, is um, is sulfide mineralized, and it was in initially interpreted um, to be um, pre amalgamation. So what we're looking at here is the northeastern margin of the Congo Kratin Kraton. And we have the uh, Karamoja belt um, has been accreted, and it's a whole series of a complex series of, um, of terrains that have been accreted onto that craton. And on the other side of, of this suture zone is the Arabian Nubian Shield. So during 2017, um, we, did, we did a, a geochemical and, um, and mapping project that identified that the Kelly Congo and um, goma um, and, and non, were non-deformed intrusions. And, at the, and, we, and we identified a whole series of, um, of related intrusions. So currently we've got up to almost 20 intrusions um, and they form uh, together a 100 kilometer belt of intrusions that are in, in, intruded into all of these different terrains um, in, in, in this mobile belt. The intrusions share uh, a complex geochemical um, uh, signature indicating multiple sources or an evolving source through time and not all the intrusions have all of the geochemical um, uh, signatures but they all share three of the four signatures so they're all clearly related uh, akali congo and ak west um, host sulfide mineralization and some of the other intrusions um, haven't, haven't really been tested yet. <clears throat> okay. So this um, this section here uh, is a schematic section of uh, a Kelly Congo, uh, and what you can see here is the in in intrusion is uh, 300 meters thick, three to 400 meters wide, and down plunge, um, it, it extends for at least 1,500 meters, and it's still open. It's a complex. It, zoned intrusion with internal contacts. So here what you can see is there's an, an upper intrusion which um, is a fractionated intrusion. It's uh, got norites and, and gabbros to the top. Um, and um, this intrusion um, doesn't always overlie the lower intrusion, but where it does, you can see that there's an erosive uh, contact. Um, the lower intrusion is predominantly ultramafic rocks and it's more of a dynamic intrusion. It hosts um, numerous zones with hybrid um, zenoliths. Um, it has internal chills, and it has um, uh, quite it's, it's quite well sulfide endowed. Now, the upper intrusion has high tenor sulfide, um, but it's what, what's happening here is is you're just achieving sulfur saturation. So therefore, the sulfides that are present are the first ones that are forming and therefore they're scavenging metal 
out of this magma. So they're very high tenor, but there's not much of it. In the lower intrusion, you've got intermediate tenor sulfides, and, but there's far more of them. So the, the sulfur generation event has been far greater, but it, it scavenged more metal, but it's become diluted. Um, to, on the base, there's a massive sulfide body that, con that is extending all the way along. It's unfortunately fairly thin. Um, okay. So again, if we look at the contact relationships, what we can see here is there is the contact <coughs> between the intrusion and the foot wall nice. And what we can see here again is that there's no deformation on this contact. The intrusion is non-deformed and the nice is... is um, is deformed. Um, the immediate contact zone is contact metamorphosed and, and occasionally there's a chilled margin present. Um, excuse me, just take a drink. Um, within the intrusion, such as here, there's a, there are numerous partly assimilated zenliths of deformed gneiss. So this is, this is a um, close-up of, of that zenlith. And what you can see here is this is the intrusion. It's, it's hybridized. It's pretty contaminated um, by oxonite. And the, the zenolith has been partially assimilated. And all that really remains are palimpsest um, trains of um, garnets, which are more resistant to assimilation. So... The Cali Congo is the most differentiated set of intrusions that we're going to talk about. Um, and the upper part of the intrusion is Gabbro, overlying norite. Uh, and, the, and what you can see here, this is actually an internal contact between two different pulses of magma. So you can see a fine grained micro norite, uh, a contact zone, and then um, pyroxenite overlying it. Poikolytic Hartsburgite and more granular um, Hartsburgite as well with sulfide mineralization. What this intrusion also has is this pegmatoidal norite, and you can see the zoned plagioclase grains. Um, this is quite interesting because it's present in a lot of these intrusions, and it forms um, veins and blows that sharply cross cut the other lithologies. Um, again, none of these, not, none of these uh, lithologies are altered or deformed. Okay, so the intrusion hosts uh, disseminated, extensive disseminated mineralization um, up to 65 meters um, uh, of variable metal tenor. Uh, massive sulfide zones are present that are, that are high, high grade and low grade. So the low tenor massive sulfide is generally adjacent to the margin. And it's um, and it's adjacent to, to areas where the country rock is has um, sedimentary sulfide. So the intrusion incorporates that sulfide, but the effect is to actually dilute down the grade. So other massive sulfide, which is a more primary magmatic signature, such as illustrated here, um, is is higher grade. And what you can see here. Uh, um, again, similar to the image from Antarctica, you can see the, the pyroxenes here are non-altered. So you can see these are beautiful orthopyroxenes. Um, and also the, the sulfide here is quite interesting because what you can see um, on this tornado image is that you've got large um, pyrotite grains and then the pentlandite is forming loop texture around the, 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 um, the pyrotite. This again is a, is a typical feature of large deep seated um, intrusions where you have slow cooling and the, the pentlandite exsolves out to the margins of the pyrotite crystals. Okay, so um, the intrusion um, contact zones also, the Kali Congo dis display some nice features in the core as well. So it's a common fallacy that intrusions have to intrude along a structure. You'll hear this mentioned many, many times. It's actually not true. So what you can see here are um, marginal offshoots into the country rock from the main intrusion. And the top example is peridotite that intrudes nice. 
And then the bottom example is massive sulfide intruding into NICE. And what you can see here with the peridotite is that it's intruding along these fractures. And you can see these fractures here, they have a consistent orientation and the intrusion um, dilates and links up these fractures to form this initial morphology, which if this were to develop into a larger intrusion would then be flooded and soaked off and assimilated. The massive sulfide is doing exactly the same as the peridotite. So again, it shows that there's commonality of process. And what you can see here as well is that the, the massive sulfide itself is predominantly pyrotite, but in the country rock around it, you can see here, there's a, a halo of chalcopyrite. So this illustrates the, as, the, as this sulfide cools, it expels a, chalco, it expels a copper li li uh, rich liquid, which has a, an incredibly um, efficient wetting capability. So it intrudes along the grain boundaries and forms these halo zones within the country rock. Okay, so now we'll move to um, Madagascar. This is the final one, Londo Comanana. So uh, the Madagascar itself is, um, is, a, is a fragment of the central part of the East African orogenic belt. So it's an incredibly complex terrain. Um, that was that was, that was um, uh, located between India and uh, Africa. So, within the central um, um, part of Madagascar, there's a whole series of um, of Archean um, belts. Um, so, uh, and some of which uh, host in, um, uh, intrusions. Uh, and the, these intrusions tend to form elongate parallel belts, some of which are nickel sulfide mineralized and some of which are chromatite mineralized. So we're going to look at the, um, the Londo Comanana region, um, which is a, a 40 kilometer uh, long belt of, um, of nickel sulfide and PG mineralized intrusions and placed into the, into the Neo Archean Beferona group, which is amphibolite and migmatite. Um, and the chromatite mineralized intrusions are located to the east. Um, some intrusions, such as Ranamina, which is down here, um, host both sulfide and chromatite. Interestingly, this terrain um, has magmatic sulfide with a very variable metal content. So Ranamina, in, a, in addition to chromatite, has nickel copper PG sulfide. And Sahabi, uh, which is up at the top here somewhere, and Sahabi, and Sahabi is there. That has nickel copper sulfide. And Lava Trafo, which is down here somewhere, Lava Trafo is there, has low sulfide PGE. Now these intrusions are still like fingered compartmentalized intrusions and, and they all plunge at approximately 40 degrees to the northeast. So the intrusions, this is from Lava Trafo, and what you can see here is a two to three meter thick chilled margin against gneiss, which again has been contact metamorphosed to a granoblastic texture and with a glassy appearance. So commonalities are starting to become apparent. The lithologies include uh, massive coarse grained pyroxenite, felspathic pyroxenite, um, pyroxenite and olivine pyroxenite, and then poikilitic hartsburgite. And again, you can see that none of these lithologies show any evidence of tectonic scale deformation. Looking at the core, this reinforces the point. So, um, and it also reinforces that these intrusions are overwhelmingly ultramafic. There's very little in the, in the way of fractionated rocks here. So massive pyroxenites. Um, and then at Dranamina, you can see here we've got a a Hartsburgite, and it, again, it's starting. It, it's it's indicating these same uh, post-cumulate textures and, and silica contamination that we've seen at other intrusions. <clears throat> at Londo Comanana, there's abundant evidence of dynamic emplacement and and repetitive emplacement and destruction of earlier formed um, sills. So here we can see um, chromatite layers. That, are, that have um, 
a dynamic, well, they've been emplaced and they've, they've destroyed pre existing stratigraphy and they're transporting angular autoliths of lithified pyroxenite. Other chromatite layers show evidence for erosion of the underlying um, partially lithified um, intrusion and they have more gradational upper contacts. And also, um, you can see that there are autoliths of fine grained um, Noritic rock which is enclosed in coarse grained monomineralite pyroxenite with no intercumulus minerals. Now these features here particularly are present as a lot of intrusions uh, all over the world and they're interpreted to be the former chilled margins of precursor sills which then get flooded by later influxes of magma. Um, further evidence in the core of, um, of uh, dynamic magmatic uh, processes. So here at Ansar Harbi is a pyroxenite unit and it's been brecciated and intruded by this felspathic zone. So um, late stage migration through partially lithified um, host rock. And also um, uh, intrusive chromatites as well. So here what you can see is another pyroxenite unit that's been brecciated and it's been intruded by chromatite. So you, you've got, you see two instances here, and this chromatite is actually intruding in to already lithified pyroxenite. Sulfide mineralization is um, variable and fairly ubiquitous. So here within the um, poikolytic Hartsbergite, you can see this um, blebby and disseminated mineralization, chalcopyrite, and also these, these little blebs here are polymineralic. So is, there's um, what, what looks like pentlandite and uh, pyrotite there. Um, within the pyroxenite, the sulfide uh, accumulations and net textured zones um, form these um, zones that locally infiltrate and brecciate. So you can see these blocks of uh, pyroxenite here and the sulfide is is working its way through this um, matrix. Coarse pegmatitic pyroxenites, and again here you can see um, chalcopyrite and pyrotite, and then also intervals that have sulfide and chromatite mineralization. So, right, back to the bigger picture. And what we're gonna look at here is an is a, um, intrusion orientation as a fairly reliable guide to um, the crustal, crustal stress field at the time of emplacement. And conversely, using um, global tectonics um, to assess emplacement timing. So when we look at the orientations of these intrusions, which is the purple um, line here, relative to the um, fabrics in these um, sectors of the, uh, of the global orogeny, what you can see is the intrusions are orientated um, normal to the direction of stress, which is in indicated by these, these arrows. So the intrusions are orientated parallel to the regional fabrics, which are extensional fabrics within these um, suture zones. Yeah, these relationships are consistent throughout this global orogeny. Um, and <clears throat> if you look at other intrusions in, in other orogenies as well, such as the, the Kivaran or Fraser Range, you're going to see exactly the same relationships. So there's a consistency of process here that is not confined to one event. It's actually a process related consistency uh, related to emplacement of intrusions into the deep crust. Okay, so we can distill all of this lot down uh, into a toolkit, and I'm not going to run through this list, but here it is. So what what you have, what you what you try to do when you're interpreting um, a, an intrusion and a setting is you need to identify the key features to to identify to show definitive constraints constraints on timing and style of emplacement. So all of these parameters need to be looked at. 
um, when arriving at a, a genetic model. So finally, uh, with respect to the intrusions that I've shown you, what we can say are the following. All intrusions have sharp contacts with their intensively formed nice host rocks. And sometimes, but not always, they have chilled margins. It's commonly um, stated that in, within these belts, the, um, the deformation wraps around intrusions, which act as a sort of a hard, hard block within these erogenous. I don't really ascribe to this, but if that were the case, which is, which, are, which is possible, there would be strained partition on the contacts. And we haven't seen that in any of these illustrations. All intrusions have subtle but distinct contact metamorphic aureoles that are not themselves metamorphos. All intrusions host already deformed zenoliths. Therefore, they have to post-date peak orogenic deformation. All intrusions are hosted within orogenies related to Gondwanaland amalgamation, parallel to the orogenic margin and normal to maximum compressive stress, all within exhumed high-grade metamorphics. So therefore, they're related to the closing phase of the orogeny and they were emplaced at deep crustal level. And we're talking probably 10 to 15 kilometers here. All intrusions have a similar suite of lithologies. They're predominantly variably crustally contaminated, mantle-derived tholeitic comartiatic basalts, with evidence of multiple magma injections into a dynamic conduit environment. Numerous intrusions are mineralized with local differences in metal budget. Primary magmatic mineralization can range from disseminated to very high grade massive sulfide with abundant ev evidence for sulfide liquid mobility and injection. And most importantly, this terrain or these terrains are predictable. They're well exposed. They're globally uh, extensive. It's distinct to a continental flood basalt, which is the first to be eroded. These terrains are actually remarkably resilient. So for all of these reasons, these, these this um, class of intrusions, which effectively is, as I say in, in, the, in, the, um, in, the, in the in the title of the talk, these are in a class of their own. They're, you can't say they're a variant of something else because they're actually unique. And because they're predictable, well-exposed, extensive um, in terrains that are easily mappable, um, they should be a major focus for the next generation of nickel sulfide exploration and discovery. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Richard. Thank you for that. Very interesting with all the overview of all the, the global settings. Thanks for all your time, Richard. Thanks for that. Yeah, pleasure. Dion? Uh, yes, from, from our side, you know, for, for and on behalf of the uh, Northern Cape, uh, GSSA branch. I would really like, would like to thank you, Richard, for sharing so generous, generously your knowledge. I definitely have a, another role model after today's talk. Um, so <laughs> it's pretty impressive. So yeah, thank you for your time. And uh, I think probably on behalf of all the guests as well, I think we all enjoyed your talk and uh, yeah, it's been impressive. So thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much. Only a pleasure. <laughs> yeah, you do all the same stuff if you ever visit Yaka Mains Pan. So it's, uh, yeah, you can put it into practice. <laughs> great. Yeah, no, thank you. And uh, have a great afternoon, everyone. So thank you for your attendance. Appreciate it. We had a good turnout. So very cool. Great. Have a good week further. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Good.